let's get started. Emily Harris, talking about school safety. Hi, Dylan. Hello. So, my name is Emily Harris. I work for Vermont Emergency Management as the Northeast Regional Emergency Management Program Coordinator. That's a mouthful. Uh, part of that job is I'm also the vice chair of the Vermont School Crisis Planning Team. So, the Vermont School Crisis Planning Team actually started in 1999. It was a group of volunteers who got together to say statewide we need some school safety best practices that we can share with schools. In 2016, the Secretary of Education and a uh, Commissioner of Public Safety decided to formalize that team by adding additional members, coming up with formal voting structures, and also creating the Vermont School Safety Center. The School Safety Center is actually uh, the group that makes the formal recommendations to say, here are the things we're seeing at the national level that are going really well and are best practices, and those are the practices that are shared with schools. Those are available through the School Safety Center website, which I will uh, advertise, I guess, right now. It's schoolsafety.vermont.gov. And that includes a lot of resources. So one of the big things that the school crisis planning team put together is something called the School Crisis Guide. And that's a suggested plan for schools to use um, if they don't already have an emergency operations plan. Do you have a question? Oh, sorry. No, no. Okay. Okay. Um, there's also training resources available on there as well as exercise resources. So schools, when they have the time, can go and just click buttons and watch videos that we've created for best practices and uh, emergency preparedness exercises where scenarios are given to them and they then say, okay, how would we respond to this? Also, we have um, in the back, uh, he's going to be testifying a little bit later, um, Rob Evans. He's our school safety liaison officer, and he actually will go into schools and help them um, identify those areas for improvement. And in fact, this afternoon, we're going up to Richford Schools to help the supervisory union to say, <laughs> to say, hey, where are you at, and what are the next steps you can take to improve your plans, your training, and your preparedness? So that's my little spiel, and I'm here for questions. Okay. Questions? Yes. Well, so I will ask, uh, you know, it, it, it seems like a topic that the legislature is poised to get into, mm -hmm. aside from the $5 million in mm -hmm. funding. Um, I, I question whether it's necessary. It seems like there's already a lot going on. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm on a school board in the Middlebury area, and I know that there are a lot of uh, informational resources available mm -hmm. and training. Um, so I guess if, if you were to say, I'd like the legislature to do this or that part, we, we got this covered, but what would you say? So I would say there's a lot of good work that's been going on. Um, there are conversations happening tomorrow with Senate institutions, I believe, specifically about that grant program. And that's really a question higher above my pay grade for my commissioner and my director to be uh, answering. So I don't feel comfortable answering the question about, you know, is that money necessary? Oh, no, I wasn't. Money oh, okay. seems good, but just other, outside of the, the grant program, oh. um, you know, what should we be dipping our toes into oh, or, so, or not? Yeah, so one of the things that we've been uh, focusing our attention on is training on the incident command system. So um, is anyone here familiar with the incident command system? Excellent. Well, I'm happy there's a couple of folks. So the incident command system is what first responders use uh, when they're responding to an incident. And a lot of schools don't know what that system looks like or how they would integrate into it. So we've been promoting that schools take a three-hour class that we go out into their school and deliver. I actually delivered one yesterday where there was a principal and a superintendent there um, so that they understand what their role might be and how to communicate with first responders when something happens. We're also this summer going to be focusing on uh, crisis communications. So um, a lot of schools struggle with what messaging to put out to parents, how to communicate with the media. So we actually have a little training that we offer to schools and supervisory unions on that. So we're doing some really good work in this area. And we have been for a while. It's not a new thing that we've started doing this year. It's been going on for years. Representative Cooper. <clears throat> Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it's great work. I've heard that. 911 calls from someone that there's like a 55% availability mm -hmm. to our schools. So I call 911. They may go 10 miles away from the school I'm at because yeah. they're going to the central office, central office type of thing. Is this, is that 
True. So that's actually not something that my group works on. That's the Enhanced 911 Board with Barb Neal, and I believe she's testifying either today or tomorrow before a committee. I, isn't it actually this committee? No, no, it's not this committee, so it must be tomorrow before our institutions, because I know she's testifying immediately after us one of these days. But she actually does do the reports where she makes the calls out. I don't, I don't have the data to tell you what that answer is. Representative Beck. As regard to school safety and the different organizations in the state of Vermont, mm -hmm. I mean, do we have too many cooks in the kitchen? I mean, 620,000 people, 76,000 students, seems like we have a lot of different organizations that are doing things. So is it too many, just right, not enough? So I would say that the real benefit of the school crisis planning team is it's pulling together those key organizations. So on that team, we've got the Division of Fire Safety, Emergency Management, Agency of Education, VSBIT, um, EMS, Department of Health, Motor Vehicles. We're pulling together all of these organizations to say, what are the best practices? Disseminate them back out through your organization. Let us know what you're telling people so we can have a consistent message. So that's the real key of that team is having a consistent message where we are all promoting the same best practices. Okay. Right. That sounds um, really good. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why we formalized that team back in 2016 was there were some agencies that were missing from that table and we said we really need to have representation from these areas. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great. Other questions? Thank you very much. Excellent. No problem. Actually, I would ask, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, um, so there's been this uh, proposal from the governor to um, use capital money to help schools be safer. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you interface with that money at all, or is this strictly go to public safety, or how, how is that projected to work? So I believe that that's going to be discussed tomorrow at the Senate Institutions Committee exactly what that looks like. My understanding is that a bill has passed the House right now that does have Department of Public Safety um, being the people who pass that money through, but we'll see what happens in the Senate, <laughs> um, and they're going to be discussing that tomorrow. And is that your understanding is the best way to utilize that, those dollars? Uh, to have it come through the Department of Public Safety? Yeah. I think that that's effective, yeah. Great. Thanks a lot. Maybe it's a little bit selfish working for the Department of Public Safety. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Tom Anderson, please. So Commissioner Anderson has um, Emily and Rob Evans here in his stead. And I'm Erica Borman. I'm the Director of Emergency Management. And I also represent Commissioner Anderson today. OK, so who's ever uh, speaking for him is next up. She wanted to say one more thing. Yes, sorry, um, go ahead. So I, first of all, you need to identify yourself for the record. Yes, uh, for the record, Eric Portman. I'm uh, the director of uh, the Division of Emergency Management under the, the, the uh, Department of Public Safety. And um, he did say that um, it, he had something that pulled him away, but he's only about 15 minutes away. So if there's a, a sticky question that um, you, you would like to have answered, and it can only be answered right here. I'll give call. Okay. Well, you, you'll just decide whether you have adequate answers right. or whether you right. need to call <laughs> again. That's why I'm here, sir. <laughs> Welcome. If you identify Thank you. yourself for the record, please, and give us your testimony. Yeah, good morning. My, my name is Rob Evans. I'm the uh, school safety liaison officer for Vermont's Agency of Education and Department of Public Safety. And I'm coming not only from that formal title, but I'm coming from a parent that raised three children in the Essex school system and also had those three same children that were in those school systems uh, when the tragic events took place back in 2006 and also had the uh, either a fortunate or unfortunate uh, past experience to lead the tactical uh, response to the Essex school shooting back in 2006. So very, very um, aware of the sensitivities about school safety and, and how long and the comprehensive work that has been done over the years since that uh, took place. All of this work uh, that Emily uh, brought up, you know, is steeped in traditions that go back all the way to 1999. This is, you know, close to 20 years worth of school emergency preparedness that has taken place. 
across the state. And it first started uh, in the Essex community um, by Leo, Chief Leo Nadu from the Essex Police Department and those school safety stakeholders <coughs> in Essex that began to try to have a conversation about how we raise the level of emergency preparedness in our schools across the state and being sensitive to the open and welcoming environments that we want all of our kids and our faculty and staff to have in our schools, but also being sensitive that they don't learn if they don't feel safe. So that work has been in place and continues to go on uh, for close to 20 years. As Emily mentioned, um, I see what we are doing in Vermont, and I have a perspective nationally of what's taking place as well in other states. Um, we, we are on the forefront in the state as far as what we are doing for school emergency preparedness, where we have brought together for years, collaborative partners from mental health and Red Cross and fire EMS and law enforcement and principals and associations, superintendents association, school board association, VisBit, anybody that's got a stake in school safety has had a seat at the table for years. And to answer your question, are there too many cooks in the kitchen? I see that as years ago we had just that, where there were pieces of, of school emergency preparedness in one pot and another pot and another pot. Now they're in one big pot. And everybody that needs to have a seat at the table has a seat at the table. So I think we all should be very, very proud of the work that has been done. And I commend the Commissioner of, of Public Safety and, and the Secretary of Education and the Governor that when they formalized the process through the School Safety Center, um, that really, in my opinion, was a home run because now there's one thing uh, that folks can turn to to say, if I need a resource or I need expertise, this is where I go to for that. And nobody in the state in this world should have any doubt that there are resources that are available, and I'll talk about some of those right now. Um, over the last several years, we've highlighted a couple of training uh, perspectives and priorities and initiatives across the state. We've provided incident command and behavioral threat assessment training, uh, crisis communications training, um, anything that uh, executive leadership teams in our schools might need to help them deal with a, a specific crisis, that has been the focus of our training for the last several years. We've provided school crisis planning, uh, response plans, and, and planning templates so that if folks are beginning to put those plans together, they don't have to develop it on their own. There are templates and plans that literally they can go through and put my school here and my name here and phone numbers for that. So it really makes them makes it easy for them to develop, develop these comprehensive plans. And for years what we heard from uh, school leadership teams were we get the need but we don't have the resources. Well now they have some guiding principles and some practices that are in place that can help them with that. We've worked hard to meet with local and state uh, level school safety partners on a monthly basis to talk about best practices in school safety. We've met with local and regional emergency management directors to give them a heads up about what's taking place and how they should be a part of the school safety and emergency preparedness process. We've hosted four, I think five, um, governor's school safety conferences over the last several years where we have brought in close to 300 school safety partners once a year from schools, from first responders, from mental health, school counselors, school nurses, into one conference to talk about the things that are on the cutting edge of school emergency preparedness. There's two things that I think, thankfully, we were on the forefront of that. One of them is the behavioral threat assessment process. And what I mean by that is identifying ahead of time risk-based behaviors that may have a negative impact on our school. And for two solid years, we brought in national thought leaders from Sigma Threat Management Associates to come to Vermont and teach our school safety partners how to do a comprehensive assessment of threats that may have those types of negative impacts at our school. And I'm proud to say that the folks at Fairhaven High School use some of those very same practices and policies to evaluate that threat. And thankfully, because of some of the work and lots of other work that was done down there. I'm confident that we obviously stopped one of those awful things from happening because of some of the work that had already been done in the state. The last conference, um, we focused on individual and organizational resiliency in, in, in an organizational environment. And what I mean by that is how do teachers and administrators and first responders remain resilient after a critical incident takes place? This all came about because of the tragic incidents that took place at Harwood Unit High School where we had obviously five of our students killed up on the interstate. And you can only imagine the traumatic um, 
impacts of that incident still remain there today. And we felt it was important with all of the incidents that are taking place across the state, South Burlington last year, Essex, Fairhaven, these things have a stress-based impact um, after these types of events that we felt it was important that we give the, the educational folks as well as the first responders an opportunity to learn best practices and how to remain resilient as an individual and as an organization. This last uh, September, uh, the governor uh, had a governor's proclamation proclaiming the month of September as, as school safety month where we kind of asked first responders to go and make a visit during that month and check on the schools, make sure they've got emergency contact information. And I think that was just another awareness type of thing that we put in the minds that, hey, this is important for folks at the beginning of the school year. Every twice a month, uh, schools across the state through the Agency of Education's weekly field memo get a what we call a What If Wednesday. Um, that is a, a survey tool that I send out and I craft that goes to every single principal and superintendent that literally is a survey tool that says, if this happens today, what are you supposed to do? If there's a bus accident, what's supposed to happen? If there's smoke in the building, what's supposed to happen? And in 30 seconds, principals and superintendents can share that with their staff so that for 15 or 30 seconds in the morning, we're thinking about safety and security in our school. With that tool, we're also able to get some feedback. When they push the wrong bar, push the button and it's the wrong answer, we then can identify we've got a training need because we're seeing the feedback critically from the schools that are doing these surveys. We've mandated school lockdown and fire drills throughout the year. Um, so schools are required to alternate um, lockdown drills and, and, and fire and evacuation drills. Uh, I provide on-site on -site school safety assessments throughout the year, so if schools or supervisory unions like Emily talked about want us to come in and do an assessment, it's a 30,000-foot it's assessment, but they come away with what they're doing well and probably more importantly, what, what they have to fix. Um, I spend a couple hours talking with their leadership team, do a very quick walk around the building and give them some ideas and also share some resources about where they might want to go for the next three, six, nine months. And probably most importantly, um, you know, obviously the governor's initiative, working through public safety, um, every single, for the most part, Emily, what's the, what's the, the percentages of? 95%. So 95% of our public, private, and independent schools got a visit from a local cop, a county sheriff, a deputy, or a state police trooper coming to their school to gather some information and do a site assessment for all the schools that will hopefully give us a better picture of what we're doing well, where we've got some operational areas for improvement, and we'll hopefully be able to, if the funding does come, drive some of those planning, uh, training, and equipment resources that we can deploy to the field for those identified uh, limitations that we have out there. I forget which committee member had asked, you know, where the priorities for funding and, and what can we do more. There are all kinds of things, and I wish that I could point to just, you do this one thing and it's going to be safer. It's not just school resource officers. It's not just technology. It's not just threat assessments. It's not just incident commit. Unfortunately, it's all of it, and it requires resources, and it requires personnel. And right now, we're all doing a good job, but it requires more. Um, if we're going to head down this path and trying to enhance the level of safety and security in our school, there's going to need to be more of us and more resources to go out there and do the business of the day. I want to uh, you know, finish my comments by saying our principals and superintendents, in my opinion, they get it. They get the need for it. And they're balancing the need for safety and security with the need for everybody to come through the door and feel that this is a welcoming environment for them to come and, and to learn. They have been active partners in this, and uh, every place that I go, um, they are actively engaged in, in this school safety dialogue and conversation. So I'm very proud of the relationships. I'm very proud of our partners and the work that they have done across the state over the last couple of years. And I'll end my comments and open it up for questions. Great, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Um, do you have these comments available electronically? Typically, we like to post testimony on our website, and I don't see anything from you. I, I can give you um, my com the ad lib stuff. Uh, probably not, but I have bullet comments of some of the training initiatives and priorities that I can share with you. That'd be Certainly. great if you could give, uh, I will. give them to our staff assistant so we can post them. Certainly will. The other thing I'd like to ask, well, go ahead. Uh, I, 
can get it's, my I'm later. perfectly happy to no, wait. No, no, go ahead, Representative So you, yeah. you were mentioned about, thank you, you mentioned about the 95% of, I, I, I've been calling these um, school safety audits or something for my own sure. understanding of them. And I, I know my school had, we, we actually were supposed to have a meeting one day at the school, but we ha couldn't because there were a number of police officers in there looking over the school. My question is that, first of all, I, I'm assuming we're trying to get 100% of our schools. Uh, we're trying really okay. hard. So um, when do, what, what is the process from now forward? And, that, and or, do you expect that's going to drive the conversation if this money does come, become available for those $25,000 um, grants for school districts. Will this be what is informing our school districts as to where we need to spend our funds? Yes, I mean that, that's the rationale in, in, in why we wanted to get somebody inside of each and every school across the state and it, you know, I think 95% return rate on anything, uh, any it's survey, it's any invitation, in a, and it wasn't even a full month, we're talking probably right. three and a half weeks. Right. Um, think about what that is that is a huge huge lift that the commissioner um, you know really should be commended for 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 making that happen I, I, Emily and I were thinking how, how do we get this done um, but it, it, we got it done so of course the drive is to get to 100% um, we know the schools that haven't gotten a visit and we'll continue with that process as well our desire and design of this survey was to the questions were asked and, and the information is being gathered for specific areas that we we, we wanted to get a look at to say, okay, we're getting this right, or for example, does every classroom door have a locking mechanism? Does every school lock the doors um, you know, throughout the business day? What type of security technology solutions are schools using? Do you have an SRO? Do you have cell phone coverage that's reliable in your area? Those are the types of questions that we now will be able to take a look at, have the data about where we are for percentages, and then be able to identify where those future priorities for the funding would go. That will be my guidance, and I'm assuming that that will be the guidance that we will follow when, if and when the money comes available. So each school will get a response, or are you doing it in aggregate? And aggregate, um, and, and right now we're taking a, a state look. We're not breaking okay. it down geographically. We're not breaking it down by supervisory union. Okay. Um, we will be able to tell you how many, what's the percentage of Vermont schools that do this or don't do that. Thank you. Representative Webb. Um, when we had the capital bill uh, a couple of weeks ago, I don't know if you looked at that one, H923, which is currently in Senate institutions, there was a floor amendment to create an advisory group um, to study uh, issues and develop guidelines and best practices for schools regarding safety. Um, we never had a chance to have that language in our committee. I'm just <coughs> hoping that you will take a look at that and, and see from what I'm hearing that is that they're looking for. It sounds like a lot of what you just presented to me. Tell me to us. You know, I, I'm of the opinion um, that we have committees and teams that have existed for years working on these issues and systems and practices and connections and probably most importantly relationships long-term relationships visbit visbit partners you know if if jeff francis or principals associate these are folks that we're talking with every single week um, and I, sometimes more is not better um, if the system isn't broken, we can certainly add to it if we need to, but practices and systems and teams are in place, and my recommendation is we've done great work, and, and I think, you know, if subsets of those teams need to be developed to do those things, then I think that's a great idea, but I'm not sure that developing others is... But I would encourage you to check in with Senate institutions. <laughs> Good. So as, as you might imagine, as and Jeff chair, Francis just walks through the doors. So. <laughs> as you might imagine, as chair of the education committee, I've been asked about school safety in the hallways. Um, one of the things that I've been uh, the, the, the concern that's been expressed to me is that if public safety does all these uh, evaluations of schools, it's all going to be about locked doors uh, and and uh, no, 
not looking at things like air vents that that uh, could be accessed for uh, yeah. for terrible things to happen. Um, is that concern valid? And and um, and what uh, steps are you taking to yeah. make sure that you see the whole picture of the school? Do you mind if I actually interject there for a second? Is that is this an allowable thing? Yes. So I work for Vermont Emergency Management, which is under the Department of Public Safety. And when we design the survey, we look at things from an all hazards perspective. So we were asking, what plans do you currently have in place? Are you using uh, options-based approaches? So things outside of just, are your doors locked? Are you, you know, following those best practices? We looked all hazards. So it wasn't just focused on the locking of the doors. We didn't have air vents in there, but um, we did have a lot of things in there that weren't just you know, active shooters. <coughs> because again, from Vermont Emergency Management's perspective, if you're prepared to respond to a flood or a hazmat event, it's gonna help you when an active shooter event happens as well. And to dovetail what, what Emily um, just said, you know, we base where we're gonna spend our dollars and spend our time on probabilities, right? Um, you know, they, they, we look at what's the, the most likely thing for folks to experience um, and what they might potentially be exposed to from a threat. Um, is, is it active shooter? Is it a violent intruder? I'm going to sit here and tell you that the probability of that is extremely low that some, that type of event would take place. High probability events are, I've got an angry parent that comes uh, to school because I got an F and, and my kid's sitting out you know, uh, of school for three or four days. Or I, or I have a staff member who's about to get fired or there's smoke in the building or you know, I, I've got flu, you know, wh whatever those, the highest probabilities are where we're spending our smart dollars on. But it doesn't mean that we aren't taking a broad picture, but spend 75% of your time on what you're most likely will be uh, exposed to and spend 25% of your time and resources on that crazy stuff that none of us you know, can ever be prepared for. And that's the way we kind of prioritize is a threat-based based analysis Let's figure out what those um, threats might be and then spend our time and our dollars on those appropriately. Mm -hmm. does, that, does that answer your yeah, question? that's right. Yeah. The, um, the other thing, I try to watch the morning news on TV before I come here in the morning just to see what's happening in the world on my way. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there was a news story this morning about um, uh, SRO, school resource officers, yeah. and that um, we're also working on an ethnic studies bill and thinking about mm -hmm. bias and, um, and prejudice in our schools in particular. And they said uh, that the, the incidents of uh, minorities being uh, <coughs> expelled, suspended and expelled from school were far greater in schools that had SROs. And I wonder if you have looked at that or if you're going to look at that and uh, what, what that says about bias in our schools. Yeah, yeah. A um, couple of things. One is that we don't have a lot of SROs in our state right now. We have 30, 32 SROs that are deployed in school systems across the state that are certified. Some of those are not active in their schools. Some of those are part-time school resource officers. And school resource officers, as I look at them, are fully trained, fully certified law enforcement officers that are supported and backed up by a sworn law enforcement agency. It's a trooper, it's a deputy sheriff, or it's a cop, all that are people that are assigned to a law enforcement organization. And because of that, they're backed up with all the training and the experience and the policies and procedures and all that stuff that comes that when Rob Evans shows up as a police officer, I come with all of what that department has to offer. Most importantly, the specific training about what being a good school resource officer is. And in my opinion, like everything, it's all about training, selection, and hiring, and not just putting any cop in a school. It's gotta be the right cop in a school that comes with the expertise about how to deal with kids at an age-appropriate level and comes with somebody that we are confident doesn't have the specific issues that you just spoke about. That happens because we don't put the right people in the driver's seat on those types of positions. And if you don't have the right person, don't put that person in that driver's seat from a school resource officer's perspective. So I'm very sensitive to the fact that 
we can get that right or we can get it really, really wrong like other agencies have done across the country. And it's absolutely um, contradictory um, for what the law enforcement organizations in our state and quite honestly in our country are trying to do in building <coughs> good relationships with our community instead of being disciplinarians. You know, the SROs aren't there to discipline. The SR, they are, SROs are there for programming, for education, for information sharing, and probably the biggest thing is is to build a trust and faith and confidence with our community members. And again, if we don't have the right people in those seats, we're getting it wrong from the beginning. I also, just because we have a school resource officer in our school, no one should think that that is a 100% commitment that one of those tragic events is not going to take place. And you only have to look as far as Parkland or Columbine or other shootings that have taken place in our school environments where there have been school resource officers there. Now, we can't know how many of those types of situations have been deterred because there's a cop out in front or because there is an SRO there, but nobody should think that just because we've got it there that they're not going to happen because we know that they possibly can. And nothing keeps a dedicated, committed person that's off the rails from doing those types of things no matter if we fortify our schools or not. If folks want to do it, instead of going into the school, they're going to do it in the playground, they're going to do it in the parking lot. You know, that's, that's why when I talk about prevention, let's spend as much time talking about how we prevent these things and making sure that the climates in our schools are good and our kids have a, have a connection you know, with that, that no kid feels like they don't have somebody that they can trust, somebody that they can go to, somebody that they can share information. Connection to the community is the way to go. It's an interesting thing that two nights ago I was at, at the Essex Community Forum, 60 or 70 parents and, and first responders were there and never seen the technology thing. They, they were able to, at their tables or on their iPhone, they were able to give direct feedback up on the a PowerPoint projector about what it, each individual sitting in the room felt was the best way to prevent a, a, a school-based violence incident. And none of it was guns, none of it was you know, securing our school, it was all about community connection. It was all about making sure that our kids feel safe, know they're safe, have a, a principal or superintendent or a best friend that they can talk to. Those are the things that the community felt like um, you know, we really need to make sure, in addition to everything else, make sure we're getting that right too. So long-winded way of getting to your... Well, you, you, you give me a great level of confidence, but it conflicts somewhat with what I heard on TV yes. this morning, which I believe was Vermont information. So I would ask you to take some time to yeah. look at that, uh, see if the news story is accurate. Okay. If it is, uh, what changes do we need to make so that we don't uh, uh, continue to have implicit or explicit bias happening in our schools, especially around school resource officers. I think, was that Dr. Fowler giving the testimony uh, with doing the, uh, from the Agency of Education, I think that maybe, because I think I saw the same news article last night. Maybe, uh, so. I didn't, I didn't okay. see her. Yeah. Uh, I, I will absolutely take a look at that. I'm eating breakfast and doing other things <laughs> at the same time. I will so. absolutely <laughs> take a look at that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, hey, Dave, Khan. this is Dylan. Can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, certainly. Rob, sorry I can't be there in person. I'm pretty sick and didn't want to share it, but uh, you know, I, I am curious. I was at that Essex Forum the other night, and I know that you probably and other stakeholders have been uh, at a number of these community forums around the state recently. Um, do you get the sense from uh, parents and other community members uh, that once they're aware of the work going on uh, with uh, the school safety initiative that's going on at the statewide level and the audit, you get this sense that communities and parents feel more comfortable as local education experts share the work that's already underway. You know, you know, Dylan. Uh, short answer: Absolutely. Um, sometimes we don't do a very good job selling the work that we're doing, and, and certainly from a principal's or superintendent's perspective, um, communication with our with our parents it, it, it is paramount. Um, you know, we have we have shared. Um, op communication opportunities with principals and superintendents to get that word out. Um, and, and I know they've done a fantastic job trying to, to let folks know without divulging state secrets um, what we're doing in our schools, but to let parents know, hey, we got it. 
and, and we've got this under control and these are the things and they're advertising when I come to the school or when Essex is doing a community forum, hey Rob Evans and other partners are going to be here to talk about that. We're coming to you know Lynn Coda's crew up there in, in Richford and I know she's going to announce to her community after our visit, hey Rob and Emily were here. Those are the types of things that Dylan I think that um, when folks take an opportunity to share that it just makes folks feel like okay our, our communities are getting it and you know, a, a lot of it's scary conversations. It's scary conversations for all of us and it's scary conversations for parents. But I think once they hear that we've had it for years, we're doing it and we're gonna continue to do it, it makes folks feel comfortable that, uh, that there are smart people in the room that are having those conversations. Yes, it is. Emily Harris from All Emergency Management. So one of the other things Rob and I are planning to do is at the beginning of this next school year, we're going to put together a video specifically for parents to say, hey parents, when something's happening at your school, here are the things you should be doing, and just as important, here are the things you should not be doing. Um, we've already got a guide available on our website for uh, schools to disseminate out to parents, but we feel that the video thing will help as well. So we're going to push that out to schools at the start of this next school year. Other questions? Yes, Representative. Uh, well, first of all, I, your your uh, philosophy in regard to Representative Webb's question about this additional study committee that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I, I would recommend carrying that along as you go. Um, going to Fairhaven, and so you know you've you've sort of said since 1999 all this work that's gone on, and, and uh, it does sound good. But despite all of that. Uh, in the Fairhaven situation, despite the fact that you know 25% of the kids didn't come to school, they were so concerned about Mr. Sawyer coming back. It really, it seemed like there wasn't anything anybody could do until this young woman from New York, caught, you know, said that this guy poses a threat. So I and I and that's based on only what I read and, and what sure. I hear, not based on what goes on behind the scenes. But could you comment on? All of the work that, that that goes into assessing threats, yet it didn't seem to, despite even the kids knowing that this was a threat, that it didn't seem to stop anything until this girl called, um, yeah. or, or her counselor called the police. So, I, I can't speak specifics um, on that case as far as the, the criminal case, but I can speak to how the threat assessment process is supposed to work and did work in this case. So, you know, we're only as good as the information that folks are willing to share, which is why we continually reinforce the if you see something, say something adage. Um, and there are a variety of different platforms that these, these threats can come in. Social media, me having a conversation, a post on a bathroom wall, a letter, conversations that folks, a variety of different ways that these things can come in. The threat assessment process is a comprehensive evaluation as to the credibility of this. Um, and what we need to make sure that we get right 100% of the time is, if it's credible, we've got to get the appropriate resources to action um, and prevent and mitigate you know, the disastrous impacts that these types of things can happen. And in that case, once that information was made known um, to specific officials, right away certain things got done. Cops got notified, state police is involved, uh, fusion centers and information centers are, are getting up. All the social media data mining is taking place and very quickly things are happening behind the scenes to ensure that that person doesn't have an access to the school once the threat has been identified. You know the hard part is if folks don't come forward and aren't willing to have a conversation and it's not brought to the appropriate authorities then it, it's out there in you know, in, in the gray area where we just don't know about that type of thing. The good part about that is as soon as that threat was made known, um, you know, to an appropriate person in position of authority and responsibility, it started to roll. And it rolled very, very quickly with a lot of stakeholders involved in evaluating that process. Um, you know, and, and an arrest got made and, you know, the consequences got mitigated and, you know, Meetings got taken place after action review that Emily and I did at that school with that staff about what they did well, what they could improve upon. Best practices were shared post-incident by Emily who did the critique on that. These are the types of things that are going on behind the scene that a lot of times folks just don't know that it's taken place, but it's taken place. So would a lot of that have taken place had the girl from New York not reported her conversation with him? Yeah, I mean, I, because it seemed like it was, it was a well-known threat. 
the students of Fairhaven were certainly <coughs> concerned about him returning to school. Cer certainly that But there was no specific. I think it's whether it's credible or it's that telephone game where I tell somebody, I tell somebody else, and by the time it gets to that person, is it valid information? Is it two years old? Is it stale? When it was actionable and it was credible, then the appropriate resources got dedicated to that threat. Um, but that's, that's the tricky part. We gotta get it right 100% of the time. They gotta get it right 1% of the time. You know? And it's, that's why we've done the training and been um, really, really progressive in bringing those, those folks together to, to train our staff um, and our stakeholders in how to do this process. So I assume you looked at Parkland to see where there was a known threat. Right. You've had an opportunity to look at that and yeah. see where, where mistakes were made and, and how to prevent. Yes. You know, and, and after each one of these incidents, whether it's in-state or nationally, you know, Emily and I and our partners and our school crisis planning team will have those conversations about, okay, do we not have these systems in place? Are these things that we do or we don't have? If they got it right, how can we steal that and, and bring it here to this state? That, that's, that's what we do, that's what we've been doing, and it's what we'll continue to do in, in the future. And we don't say we've got it all. We're always willing to steal whatever everybody else has got going on that's great. Um, and we'll continue to do that. But, but yeah, that, those types of, of, of incidents, and we'll wait till the formal after action review takes place um, and, and learn from that, just like we did from the Sandy Hook Advisory Committee. We, we took some of those recommendations and put those into best practices here as well. Is there anything you need from us? Well, um, support, you know, not just from the committee, but certainly, you know, it, it, takes, it takes money it takes resources, and I know there's competing interests on a lot of this, but if this is going to be a priority, then, you know, for lack of a better term, some, sometimes we've got to put our money where our mouth is, and we've got to dedicate the resources on that um, and find ways um, that we do what we need to do while keeping our schools the way we want our schools to be and educators focusing on education. Representative Miller. Do you think that the gun laws we recently passed helpful you know I'm, I'm not I'm not sure I'm in a position to, um, to, to speak from this role um, okay. in, in that so I, I would prefer not not Fair to enough. answer that if, if, if that's okay let me ask you another question then in Parkland in Florida why did the school resource officer or police not go into the building so we'll take you back however many years um, Columbine was. Um, Pre-Columbine, law enforcement's response, um, I like to call it, it was isolate, contain, and negotiate, where we surrounded the buildings, um, contained it from getting any bigger, and then tried to negotiate our way out of it. And we know it was disastrous results that when the cops waited outside of Columbine High School and Klebold and Harris were allowed to continue to kill inside the walls of the school, that that, that didn't go so well. So because of that, our tactics and our strategies and our practices from a law enforcement perspective changed. And they continue to change based upon the threat that we're exposed to. So now cops, any cop, not just a school resource officer, like at Essex, uh, you, you put the vest on and you go. That, that's the mentality. You know, on game day, everybody's got to show up to play. You know, and it's all good in training. It's all good when you know you go through the practices and nobody is shooting, potentially shooting back. But on game day, that cop's got to make an individual decision about whether I've got what I feel I need to do to evaluate the situation and, and go do what I need to do as a human being. Um, from my understanding, had received all of that training, and on game day, you know, didn't run with the ball. Um, there are cops that make good decisions. There are cops that make bad decisions each and every day. Um, we, for years, um, have been training with local, county, state, and our federal partners, especially up on our borders, because a lot of times our border patrol, our ICE folks, will be the first ones there. Um, we have been training collaboratively to ensure that our folks have everything that they need as far as training and equipment and resources to do it. But you know, again, on that day when you're that one cop, that uh, when shots are being fired, you're either running towards it or, or you're not. You know, and, 
and unfortunately in that circumstance, we didn't. It's hard to know that, isn't it, about a person when you hire them? Right. Right. It's like it's like anything, any anybody, you know, it, 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 no matter what job you're in, but in those first response, you, you know, you take an oath um, to to serve and protect. You go. It, it's all good to raise your hand and say, "Oh yeah," but again, when it's coming your way, it's it's a, di it's a different feeling, you know. And I, people say coward and they throw those words out there, and, and I, you know what? I'm still a human being that's got to make a, a life or death decision. That's a tough one. That's a tough call. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your testimony. Yes. Uh, Chairman Trapp, can I just make a couple comments because I can shed some light on questions that you had. I was in the Senate Judiciary After Committee. you identify yourself. Sure. Right. Jeffrey Francis, Vermont Superintendent Association. Three points. One, part of my job as the Executive Director of the Superintendents Association is to work with Rob. He's a great partner. Um, uh, and I appreciate the work that he does, and I appreciate the fact that there's more focus on that work now in light of recent events and the importance of keeping kids safe in school. Two, I was in the um, Senate Judiciary Committee yesterday. I just checked with Amy Fowler. Her comment about SROs and school discipline were based on national studies, not Vermont studies. Um, as a result of what happened in the Senate Judiciary Committee yesterday, I have reached out to superintendents and I'm developing a list of every supervisory union and school that has a school resource officer. Um, so if you reach a point where you want that information or testimony from those school systems, I'm not sure you'll get there, but I can help with that. And I've also asked her whether the state has done any study itself of a correlation between SROs in Vermont and the school discipline uh, information in those schools. I haven't heard back from Amy on that yet, but um, I thought when I read the recent, the media reports that there was some confusion around what had actually happened in the Senate Judiciary Committee yesterday, so I wanted to just point out to you this morning what I knew about what happened there. So. Thank you, because uh, uh, you know, right after that news story, my I had, I believe we took testimony last year from Amy Fowler that said um, there was not uh, bias evidence in Vermont schools, racial bias for suspensions and discipline. Right. Um, and then this new story came out this morning and my wife turned to me and said, well, I guess there really is a difference. There really is a story to tell in Vermont. So that's why I asked the question this sure. morning and, and information that you may get to shed light on this would be helpful. Okay, thank you. Because we are dealing with an ethnic study bill in front of us and the concern of the of minority populations that there continues to be bias right. uh, in our schools. So. Right. And I don't know that there's not a correlation. I don't know that it's been looked at. I've asked her that question, so yeah. we'll see what she says. Thank you very much. She just said no. There's not been any study of SROs and school discipline and any correlation thereof. Thank you. <coughs> and I, I, not just because he, Jeff, is, is sitting here, but as I spoke before, I have him on speed dial. You know, if there are issues, we've talked when he's on vacation, we've talked when I'm on vacation. Those are the relationships that are so critical in us getting this stuff right. Um, Jeff, I appreciate your comments there as well. Thank you very much. Yep, you're welcome.